Joining us now for some political analysis is USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief, Susan Page, Chief Washington Correspondent for The Washington Post, Dan Balls, plus National Editor of the Cook Political Report, Amy Walter, and Executive Editor of the National Review, Rehan Salam. Rehan, let me start with you. How much of a big deal are Donald Trump's comments and his, you know, he's not backing down on this question of Judge Gonzalo Curiel. Newt Gingrich said it was a huge mistake for him to hold this position. Does it matter? It's hard to say because what Donald Trump does, and as he did in his interview with you, is he will take one of your questions he won't exactly answer it. He will take words that you brought up in your question and he will say them again and again without actually addressing the substance of your question. And the reason he does that is to make it appear as though he's responding. And frankly, that's been decently effective so far. He doesn't address the actual charge. And the question is, do people actually believe that he's bigoted or not? If they believe he's bigoted, and of course, much of the country already does, they'll accept that this reinforces that view. If they simply don't believe it, if they believe he's basically a decent guy who's being hounded by the media in an unfair way, they'll believe that. And he recognizes that uncertainty, and he plays to it. Dan, what do you make of, I mean, Speaker Paul Ryan also spoke out about in opposition after having just endorsed uh, Donald Trump. So you've got Speaker Paul Ryan, Newt Gingrich, Senator Flake. Um, where does this leave things? John, it's almost the classic example of what we've seen throughout the entire year. Things he does and says give terrible heartburn to Republican establishment people. And over the last month since he effectively became the nominee, more and more of them have in one way or another said, I will be for him in November. And yet he does these things and they react. Their concern is that it's going to cost him the presidency and that it's going to cost the party both short term and long term. Um, but we've also seen there is another audience out there that responds in a different way to that. And so I think you always have to be careful about predicting just how bad something that seems bad is going to be. That's right, Amy. The audience Dan is talking about is the common sense audience, the one that <laughs> looks at all of the things right. we get all wound up about right. and that elites get you know spun up about. And you know, just let's have some common sense in Washington. That's the pitch Donald Trump is making. That's right. It's hard to make that pitch, though. I mean, this is the whole point, which is, what we should really be talking about today, if you were the Republicans, if you were the Trump campaign, is the terrible jobs report that came out on Friday. That should be the entire focus of this. We have an economy that has not recovered for a whole lot of people who are attracted to Donald Trump, who's saying, I'm going to bring jobs back. That would have been a message that would break through, I think, to a whole bunch of people. Instead, what we're talking about are all of these things that seem to have nothing to do with whether or not jobs are going to come back or the economy is going to recover. The other thing that's remarkable, I went back and went through the, 200, the 2013 autopsy that the Republican Party did after their loss in 2012. And literally everything he's doing right now is the opposite of what Republicans thought the next presidential candidate needed to do. Specifically on tone, it wasn't just he needs to come out and support immigration or do better with these groups. They said, if we have a tone that suggests that we don't like these people, it doesn't matter what our policies are. So when Trump says, I'm going to bring jobs back, it doesn't matter what I say about walls or about Mexicans not being able to, to take my case. That's exactly the opposite of what they learned from the last and yet. Susan, Republicans are lining up smartly behind Donald Trump, despite the tone. I mean, you know, it's not just Paul Ryan, it's Marco Rubio. And you look at the distance some of them have traveled. I mean, Rick Perry called him a cancer. Now he's saying he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, he is, they are in a sense, and people have written this, they are basically affirming everything he said about them and how quickly politicians mm -hmm. will fishtail to get to the, to the right place. Mm -hmm. So the Republican Party is, is getting behind this candidate. I think uh, se uh, senior Republicans decided they didn't have an alternative. He had won the nomination. He's going to be nominated at the, at the convention. I think one thing we're seeing is a battle for the post-Trump GOP. I mean, I think that's why you see them come out and say, I'm going to, Paul Ryan among, among them saying, I'm going to vote for him, I'm endorsing him. But I have a totally different vision on all these issues, like immigration or the Muslim judge or the, uh, the, the Mexican judge or the Muslim ban. Um, because they want to define, they want to have an alternative vision of the Republican Party to offer once this election is over, and that is on the assumption that Trump is going to lose. Because winning the nomination 
is a different electorate than they face now in the in the general election this is a much more diverse electorate it's a much younger electorate it's people who are going to be i think quite concerned voters not just elites voters concerned about the positions that he's taking there's a version of what trump is saying even actually when he's talking about nuclear proliferation. There's actually a version of what he's saying that is, in my view, defensible. He does not make that case. Time and again, rather than making, you know, an affirmative case for his views on immigration and trade, he actually keeps getting drawn into talking about his personal business affairs rather than talking about the unemployment rate. So when you're looking at Republicans, as Susan is saying, there is this jockeying for position. What do we do What do we do we now that we know the Republican Party has changed in this meaningful, material way? And you see some smart people, like Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, he is looking on the bend, and he's actually trying to be very cautious, being a good soldier for Trump, but also recognizing there is this nationalist constituency in the country. How do I speak to it in a coherent and defensible way? But that's all going to happen. Uh, that's all going to happen after Trump, because frankly, Trump, because of his obsession with his own personal business affairs, rather than really laying out a distinctive ideological direction for the Republican Party, he, he's actually not making that case. John, I wanted to pick up on something that Amy said about the, the economic situation. If you look at what Donald Trump has done since he became the presumptive nominee, it has almost entirely been backward looking. It is not forward looking. Yeah. He's settling old scores. He can't let go of things that still bother him from his successful campaign for the nomination. He needs to be reaching to a different audience. That message on jobs is something that would reach people who might not necessarily have been for him or or, or were still on the fence. But instead, he's ignoring that part of the electorate that he really would need to become president. Amy, what do you make of Hillary Clinton's speech this week? Is this a change in strategy? Is this what we're in for for the next many months? Well, campaigns are pretty simple, right? their, their choices between this or that. And it's also a referendum. Now, this, again, this is an election that on its face should be an election that Republicans should win. If it is a choice between going in the same direction that this president has been going in for the last eight years, many Americans saying we want to take a different direction. However, what she's saying is that direction is going to be led by Donald Trump, who's unstable and is going to lead us into more trouble. So the change is too dangerous. It's better to be stable than it is to have change. And that is really the only way, I think, that she wins an election in a time when people are saying they want change more than anything. One opportunity that Trump has in a funny way is that, in theory at least, he could run to Hillary Clinton's right as well as to his left. And so if you're a Democrat, the campaign you're used to running is a grinded out, this person is a right-wing extremist. And you know, there's certainly some reason to believe that with Donald Trump. The trouble is that he wears those positions so lightly, he abandons them one after another. Whereas when you go in the route that she's taking now, in the speech that she made on Thursday, by saying that he is dangerous, and actually by saying that, look, this guy attacked Ronald Reagan in the 80s. It's very interesting because it kind of lowers the temperature on that left-right ideological contest, and it's saying to a lot of independents who have lots of doubts about her, have lots of doubts about Barack Obama, to say that, look, this is very simple. You might actually find one thing or another that he says interesting or appealing, but then there are seven other things that he said that are less so, and I've gotta say, I wonder if she's gonna stick with this over time, and I wonder if Donald Trump will maybe be able to reach out to some of that Sanders vote. But I think that that's the danger. But at this point right now, Donald Trump's obsession with himself and with his own business affairs, with his own past, makes it very hard to see him breaking out of that dynamic and actually reaching out to those left-wing voters that maybe could deliver him the election in some strange world. So pity the voter. That's right. right. Pity pity Americans. You've got, he's saying she should go to jail. For stupidity, which is a hard standard, that's a that's too low a bar. <laughs> yeah. I'm going so to do. Right. In fairness, point, he does also the, uh, yeah. the the classification. And, and she says he's unstable, and and uh, she'd leave it to the psychiatrist to talk about why he's so drawn to tyrants. And one thing he said in your interview, I thought was interesting. He said she was supposed to give a foreign policy speech, and she gave a Trump speech, and that is true. Mm-hmm. She gave a speech that was really devoted to savaging Trump in a really effective way. But are we going to have a campaign that's that turns totally on the other person is even more? Yes. Unacceptable than I am, with with no serious discussion about some of the big challenges that are in Americans' own lives. I think well, I, I think, think that's right. Yes. For no other reason, <laughs> also because she was trying not to talk about emails, that's right. which is another topic. And she was trying not to talk too about. I mean, if again, his response to her speech should have been, 
her decisions that she's made and that the Obama administration has made on foreign policy have not made us safer right. and lit, lit, uh, went through the litany of issues. And instead, it was back on all of these other things that we just have been talking about. Let's switch to the Democrats here at the end. Dan, uh, Bernie Sanders says there's going to be a contested convention. What does that really mean? Do you I, I don't know what that means, John. And I think we're going to have to wait until we get through Tuesday night to see how Senator Sanders actually responds to a conclusion in this. There is a D.C. primary the week after that, but for all practical purposes, it's over Tuesday night. She will have, as David Axelrod said, more votes, more pledged delegates, more super delegates, more states won. She will have won across the board. He's going to try to make an argument. The question is, does he persist in that? Does he carry that fight forward? Uh, if he does, it's going to be messy in Philadelphia. I, I'm looking for President Obama and what he does right after this primary is over. I mean, I think it's not going to necessarily happen on Tuesday or on Wednesday, but when all the votes are tallied, when all the delegates come out, does President Obama come out and say, this has been great, good job, everybody, Hillary Clinton's our nominee, and that, I think, helps move the, the dialogue in a different direction. But does Senator Sanders respond to that? Well, That's and the, the results question. in California matter. Your poll shows it's just a two-point race. We know it's really close. But it, may, it matters not in terms of who gets the nomination. It matters on kind of the tone at the end of these contests and what the context is for trying to get Bernie Sanders to endorse I'd say Bernie Sanders has already won because Barack Obama came out and said that we should increase Social Security payments for everybody. And this is a good and sensible policy. He would not have said that a year ago, two years ago certainly not, you know, seven years ago. Uh, that is a very big deal. Why big deal? That Obama it, came out or the position? It's of a big security? deal that Barack Obama has come out and repudiated some of the kind of centrist, goo-goo, social security reforms that he had before and embraced a central plank of the Bernie Sanders campaign. He sees where the future is for the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, whether or not he could defend that position uh, to the Barack Obama of three or four years ago, I can't say. But he sees where the wind is blowing, and it's blowing in Bernie Sanders' direction. Gugu being a term for good government, not, <laughs> not what your toddler says in the morning. That's it for all of us. We'll be back in a moment.